What's up YouTube, TCM here back with another video. And today we're gonna to be looking at common vulnerabilities in web applications and how we can actually remediate them. Now you may have heard of the OWASP top 10. Today we're actually going to be looking at the Sneak top 10. Now, if you've never heard of Sneak, Sneak provides awesome software that integrates with your GitHub and other repositories and allows you to import your code and actually review it for critical findings and other bugs. For example, I can just dive into one of my repositories and look at what vulnerabilities I have, which is pretty awesome. Now, Sneak has been a longtime advertiser of the channel, and that's actually because we really use them as an organization. And that's no joke. This is our actual Slack. This is from yesterday. We have the Sneak bot imported. It comes through and tells us anytime we have vulnerabilities in our code. We truly love Sneak as an organization, and just having them as a sponsor is icing on the cake. So we mentioned vulnerabilities in the top 10. What we're talking about here is actually the sneak top 10 vulnerabilities for open source projects. And this is similar to the OWASP top 10, except sneaks actually collecting this data from the scans that they're running. And they're actually sharing this data in terms of what they're seeing for top 10. For example, number one is actually denial of service. And we're gonna go through and look at the top three vulnerabilities today and talk about what they are and how to actually fix them. If you're interested in seeing all the vulnerabilities that are in this document, such as SQL injection, path traversal, privilege escalation, and you want to find out more information that can be hiding in your applications, feel free to sign up for Sneak at sneak.co forward slash the cyber mentor. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into some of these vulnerabilities and let's look at how we can actually fix them. So the most common vulnerability Sneak finds is denial of service. If you're not familiar with what denial of service means, that means, hey, your service is being denied. There are really two common types of this. The first one is high CPU or memory consumption. Basically, a hacker is sending a bunch of requests to a server. The server doesn't know how to process all the requests that are being sent, and then it bogs it down and makes it unable to actually do anything. The other type here is a crash. Now, this means the system is taken down completely. If you are as old as I am back in the day, you used to be able to send specifically crafted messages in AOL, and you could blue screen somebody just from a message. And that was the worst if it happened to you. OK, so here I have a real life example of Eternal Blue, which we're going to see a little bit later on in this video. But what happens here is when I run Eternal Blue in this instance, I have a machine that is going to actually crash from this exploit. And this is a classic example of denial of service. Let's take a look at this crash in real time. So first, we're going to run this exploit. And we're going to see that nothing happens here. But if we go look at our screen, oh, no, we have a blue screen of death due to this exploit. So let's take a look at denial of service in the sneak application. If you look at my dashboard and we scroll down just a little bit, you can see that I have different projects in here that are vulnerable. And this one in particular, we're going to take a look at here. So I'm going to click on this Node.js, this JSON package. And with denial of service, we're typically looking at patching issues. That's usually the way that you fix this as well. So I have 106 issues specifically in this repository, and I can come in here and actually search for these vulnerabilities. So if I want to look specifically for denial of service, I can start typing in denial of service. And these range from different types of severity. So here you can see I have high severity. I can actually scroll over on the side and see, OK, what's open? What is a mature exploit? And then what's actually fixable in here? So if I wanted to look at the fixable vulnerabilities, I can click on that. OK, I've got this one right here that is fixable. So I can actually just come in here and click on fix this vulnerability. We can say, hey, learn more about this vulnerability. And it'll actually pop up a new screen and talk to us about the vulnerability that is here, which is pretty nice as well. So we can look specifically at this vulnerability. There's a full lesson on the vulnerability. If you actually scroll through this, it will teach us like, hey, what's going on under the code that's actually making this vulnerable? So if you're a developer, this is really, really great to have this education and these lessons there for you, because let's be honest, a lot of universities and educational institutions do not teach secure coding. So this is a great place to actually learn that. As we come back through, we can come in here and show more detail about the vulnerability. It tells us actually how to fix it. Hey, this one is in this marked 3.5. If we want to fix it, we need to upgrade to marked 3.18. So if we wanted to fix this manually, we would have to go out to NPM and find the latest and greatest. 
Currently the version is 5.1.1 and we needed what 0.3.18. If we scroll all the way down, we can actually find that here that that was actually five years ago. So we probably have some pretty significant patching issues in our repository. We probably want to install the latest and greatest provided it doesn't break anything. So we would come in here and we would actually go through the readme. We look at the readme here. You can see there's instructions to install. We have to use NPM. We can do it in CLI or in the browser. And that can be pretty time consuming if I'm being honest. So we could do this a little bit more easily. We can actually just come in a sneak here and hit fix this vulnerability. And this will actually automatically open up a PR or a pull request for us to fix this vulnerability. So if we come in here, you'll see that it's checked among the sea of other vulnerabilities that we have within this repo. We come in here and we say open a fix PR. It'll take just a second and then it'll open that fix for us. Now this is screen you're taken to and this is absolutely insane. Look, it knows to upgrade you specifically to this and it will do checks in here to actually see if this is going to break anything. So hey, is this going to break anything? No, it's not. And they know about the exploit maturity, all this information here. It's automatically pushed and look, you can see the commit that's happening here. It's really awesome. We can dig into everything, what files are being changed. But hey, if we want to accept this change, all we got to do is come down here and say merge pull request and we confirm merge. And then we have magically fixed the vulnerability without having to do anything else manually. Pretty awesome. Now we can come back in here and hit retest. Now we had 106 vulnerabilities before we can see what the vulnerabilities look like now and see that for sure we are patched on this vulnerability. Okay, we can see this is updated to a few seconds ago. If we scroll down, we actually have less issues by fixing that we went down from 106 to 100 which is pretty cool. So there are more than just that one denial of service vulnerability with that package. Okay, next up on the list is remote code execution. This is where an attacker executes code remotely. I know it's groundbreaking information here. Let's take a couple of examples of what this actually looks like. Okay, so an example of real life remote code execution is a vulnerability called Eternal Blue. This is very, very famous and a great example. I am sitting on an attacker machine and I am intending to attack a machine that is vulnerable to this. You can see this machine lives on this 10.0.0.10 .0 .0 IP address. And this is remote because I am not actually on this IP or this computer. So I'm going to attack this remotely and actually gain full control of this machine. Now, this is a very basic overview, but I'm going to run this exploit. This exploit is going to run. And once it does run and completes, it's going to give me a shell on this machine, which is going to give me full access. So this exploit takes just a second to run. Let's go ahead and let that do that. And we'll come right back. OK, it took about 10 more seconds here, but we have this shell now and we can actually dive into this machine by saying shell. We could say, who am I? Host name. We have complete command and control over this device. And that is awesome. And this is an example of remote code execution. Not to be outdone here, but Sneak has their own examples of remote code execution in web applications, which a famous one was Log4j that happened a couple years ago, followed up by Spring for Shell. If you actually come in this guide and click on Spring for Shell, you can come through here and read about this again, just like the other one we looked at. But what's even cooler is if you come in here, you can actually do enumeration of a web app. So like if you came in here, you could run this Nmap scan by just doing a copy and paste and hit that. You can see the Nmap scan comes back for this host. You can come back in here and it actually shows you an example of what this code execution looks like. So we're going against this application here. We're going to pull off this ID attack. So we're going to run a command of ID on this Linux machine. And when we do that, you can see that we are running as root user. Uh, we have code execution and can run any command that we want with this command execution. So great examples. And again, Sneak has a great learning and educational platform in order to learn a lot of these things. Not only that, also why the code's vulnerable and how you can fix it. Pretty neat. So when it comes to remote code execution and similar to denial of service, usually the answer is to upgrade your version or to patch here. So there's an example here for Spring for Shell that, hey, to mitigate this, you need to be using a version of the Spring framework equal to or greater than the 5.2.20 or 5.3.18. So similar to last time, we could start typing in remote code execution or you can type in RCE and you can find different vulnerabilities that exist here. And just like last time, we can actually come in here and instead of going and fixing the vulnerability manually, we can utilize Sneak to come in here and fix this vulnerability through a pull request. All we got to do is scroll down, open that, 
fix PR and do the same steps as before where we're running that commit and fixing this vulnerability. It is really that easy. All right, next up on the list is what is known as a deserialization attack. When I was just starting out with hacking and coding, this was one of the harder things to wrap my mind around. Essentially what's happening is we have serialized data that is sent over and then deserialized by the application. If we as an attacker can inject malicious data into that serialized data, and then the application goes and deserializes it, it can run that code or that malicious code and potentially get us remote code execution. Now I went ahead and uploaded some malicious code that has a deserialization vulnerability built into it. And we could take a look at this. Let's say we're a developer, we're just developing this, we uploaded our code into Sneak and it said, hey, you have this vulnerability, but we don't really know what this vulnerability means. Well, the nice thing is we can come in here and click on view full details. We can also come in here and click on learn about this type of vulnerability and how to fix it. So let's do that first. So Sneak takes us to this lesson about insecure deserialization. And if we scroll through it a little bit, they actually give us a game that we can play with Essentially, we have this game here and we want to abuse this game in order to take advantage of this attack. Well, what we can do is we can come in here and it shows us step by step. Hey, we can come copy this. And if we copy this information here and we paste this in, well, we're going to get a bunch of jumbled information back. OK, well, this looks like it's possibly Java. So if we come back in here and we actually put this into a serialized file, we can then attempt to read that. There are open source tools, example from Google, this J deserialize that we can run against that file. So let's take an example, look at that. And if we come paste and hit enter in here, we can actually see this a lot better. Uh, we have this an array in here and this array has a bunch of zeros and a one. What we're assuming, and we'll have to do a little bit of playing around, but we're assuming that that level one is our level. Maybe when we want to upgrade our level to a level 20, which is what the example is using here in this game state. So we can come in here and change the game state to this array of level 20. But what we want to do is we actually need to change the hex that's involved in here. So if we copy this and paste and look, we can look at the hex code on this serialized data and we can see down here there's a bunch of zeros with a one that's living in it. And with that one that's living there, if we change that to a 20 and then compile that, a, we may be able to actually send that over to the application and get that code execution. And look, we change to a level 20. We get a nice bigger sword here. And it goes on to explain how we can actually do this and get remote code execution. Pretty awesome. It talks about the fixes and everything else. This is a great blog and sneaks material for learning in general is really fantastic. Now, going back to our vulnerable code, if we came in here and we said, hey, I want to view the full details, we can look at this and it talks to us about what it's actually seeing. For example, we are using this code here that says, hey, we have this object input stream but we're not sanitizing the object input stream. So we can have unsafe code injected into this. So this is the data analysis of our actual code. We can do fix analysis on this code as well, where it says, hey, I see you're using this object input stream. And what you should be doing is you should be using this class loader aware in order to actually do this connection. So it's giving us a tip on how to actually come in here and fix this vulnerability. So I can come in here and copy this information and then I can make that change to my actual code. So that's really it. These are just the top three of the 10 vulnerabilities and Sneak is out there running this against thousands and thousands of lines of code and helping thousands of users with utilizing open source libraries and making sure they're not putting vulnerabilities out there. So this is a little bit skewed towards Java because that's the majority of what Sneak sees, but this is still great for all code bases. Now, if you're interested in seeing this report and learning a little bit more, you can check out the link in the description below. I'll link that report. If you're interested in signing up for Sneak, and I think you should because it is free, you can utilize this by going to sneak.co forward slash the cyber mentor, and I will link that in the description below as well. As always, thank you so much to Sneak for sponsoring this video. And if you did like the video, please do consider subscribing to the channel. My name is Heath Adams, aka The Cyber Mentor, and I do thank you for joining me. Peace out.